Hello, this is Link on Air. Today I'm going to review Dead Space 3. I was going to crack a joke about how it's similar to Lost Planet, but that's kind of been run into the ground. Now I'm still thoroughly convinced that the design docs got mixed up at some evil corporations meeting between EA and Capcom, especially considering Lost Planet 3 was announced as a survival horror game where you play as an engineer on a snowy planet who must fight off monsters with glowing yellow weak spots, and with Dead Space 3 having you play as an engineer on a snowy planet who must fight off monsters that only SOMETIMES have glowing yellow weak spots. Though fortunately that's pretty much where the similarities end. Now, before I dive into the review, there will be spoilers when covering the story. Frankly, I find the ending to be so insane that there's no way I can't. So, story. Now, basic premise is same as ever. You are Isaac Clarke, and you fight monstrosities known as necromorphs. While the series has never been known for stellar writing for the main story, Dead Space 1 established an interesting universe, and Dead Space 2 had a fairly good self-contained story focusing on how the events of Dead Space 1 impacted the protagonist. And ideally, that's where Isaac's story should have ended. Sadly, this was not the case, however, as Dead Space 3's main story was taking a large step back by making Isaac's character conflict a high school-esque love triangle between himself, Ellie, and some tosspot that I can't remember the name of. The primary antagonist is a cartoonishly evil villain named Danik, who I actually won't complain about because he's so stupidly evil it's actually pretty funny. Though, the one thing that has remained consistent throughout the series is the writing for the text and audio logs that explain the impact of the necromorphs and markers on the people who formerly resided in the respective settings of each game, excluding any logs left behind by plot-important characters. Now, for the game's ending. Spoiler alert. The final boss fight is against the moon. Yes, the moon. Apparently, the threat that has been behind the markers and necromorphs has been moon-like entities all along. Now, I know what you're all thinking, and I'm not going to claim that's the case, but frankly, at this point, it wouldn't be surprising to me in the least. I honestly wonder what made the story writers phone it in, though admittedly, the story is still somehow compelling enough to keep you playing, particularly Isaac's interactions with John Carver, the co-op character, which I'd like to say makes the co-op worth playing within itself. That being said, it's time to move on to the gameplay. Overall, the gameplay is pretty much the same as the previous entries, but with the addition of a dodge roll and cover-based combat, two things that don't really fit in a survival horror game. Though, I suppose at this point it's more action horror, isn't it? To add to the new emphasis on action, they have also introduced customizable weapons and universal ammo. The customizable weapons in the game are fantastic, with seemingly limitless combos, each of which packing the punch you'd expect from a Dead Space weapon. My favorite weapon creation was the rivet machine gun with the line gun under barrel and stasis coating, though it was stupidly overpowered. And as much as I dislike the inclusion of universal ammo in any game, I can't really argue it with weapon options as vast as these, of which I am sure caused this design decision. As much as these options distract from the horror, what little horror was left, it has made for some of the most fun gameplay I've had with a shooter in years. The co-op is also competently executed. During my playthrough, the frame rate remained consistent and the experience itself was even more enjoyable than the single player. The co-op also has its own exclusive mission to let you delve a bit more into the character of John Carver, which, if you're playing as him, you and your partner will both be seeing different things during the missions. For an early example, while playing as Carver, I came across a toy soldier, but my co-op partner couldn't see it on his end. I think it would be interesting if the rest of the series had played off of the psychological end of things like they did with Carver. And no, the Nicole hallucinations in Dead Space 2 don't count. The visuals of the game are pretty much as good as the visuals of Dead Space 2, sporting the same amazing lighting, character models, textures, and animation. Though this leads into another problem the series has had all along. It looks good. Clean and pretty visuals do not make horror, especially in combination with spectacular set pieces, and that's just the textures and character models. With the lighting, Visceral seems to have a tendency of keeping the rooms fairly evenly lit. Many of the best horror games will play to the uncanny valley effect with monster designs, or they will try to obscure their monstrosities in darkness as to leave it to the player's imagination. While I can tell that the necromorphs are designed with the uncanny valley in mind, with them taking the human anatomy and rearranging it into monstrous forms, I think they take it a bit too far and make them too monstrous. 
removing the human element that's supposed to make them unnerving. A good example of this being done right is immature guardians from Dead Space 1. While they are very minimal threats, they are still clearly human in appearance, and seem to express some degree of their humanity is still intact, which leaves the player in a position in which they don't want to kill them because of their pitiful state, but at the same time they might feel the need to put them out of their misery, creating a state of cognitive dissonance within the player. The other enemies in the game show no trace of humanity in both look and behavior, making them feel no different from killing a monster in any other game. Now, once again, I will leave the soundtrack to the musical monocle. That's the last time I'll work with Necromorphs. They have horrible posture, and I can't even get them to hold their instruments for longer than 10 seconds without gnawing on the strings or attempting to ingest the lead pipe. Musical monocle here. The Dead Space series has been known for its fear-striking atmosphere. The psychological thrill of not knowing what's around the corner, but just knowing that it won't be good has been a major aspect of the Dead Space experience. The atmosphere is usually highlighted by the use of sound, be it a deep, dark underbelly of a string section churning out unpredictable rhythmic syncopations, or a distant shrill overtone leaving you on edge as if you had a needle bearing into the back of your head. I have always been a fan of this series and its effective use of sound. Even the absence of sound can be a mood-shifting element, which in the past has put players on edge all the more. Dead Space 3 has an atmosphere that has evolved into something a bit different than that of the previous installments. This title is a bit more of a high-octane action thrill than an eerie, creeptastic horror. So, as a result, the music has adjusted thusly. Many of the original elements are still there. The dark, ominous tones, the tightly wound strings, the cinematic tactic to portray motion and emotion. But now there are more brass attacks, heavy percussion, synthetic elements, and more to portray that while the basis is the same, the experience has evolved. You can tell by the music alone that you are dealing with a bigger, more monstrously dangerous breed of game. Considering that this is the case, I would definitely say that the soundtrack is effective and certainly still a highlight of the experience. Back to you, Link on Air. Since I'm reviewing a horror game, I will be talking about the game's atmosphere as well, and this segment will also be present in any future game reviews that call for it, not strictly horror. That being said, I feel like the game is at odds with itself, it has a horror aesthetic, but the gameplay feels like a over-the-top fun shooter. I feel the gameplay currently in Dead Space 3 would be better suited towards something like, mm, I don't know, Mass Effect? Though, setting aside that issue, as a horror game, they did one of the worst things a dev for a horror game can do. Can you tell what's wrong here? I'd say at least one or two of these could have had a decent scare, but they made the mistake of taking the camera away from you and saying, Hey! Hey! Look at this! You see this? Good! We don't want this to be scary, do we? And this pisses me off, literally every time I see it. For a horror game, that is criminal. I had heard many people also claim that putting the game in a bright, snowy environment would also fail at horror, but me, being the optimist I am, thought that perhaps they could use the whiteout of a snowstorm or buried necromorphs to effectively scare you. And it would have worked, but the draw distance goes a bit too far, and as always, the necromorphs come charging at you from the front 90% of the time, and they hint that necromorphs are hiding under the snow well before you have the opportunity to face them. Also, do you remember how when you were in the vacuum of space in the first two Dead Space games, the sound would go away with the exception of Isaac's breathing? Well, for some reason, that's gone too, sort of. They added in music in the background, though I suppose now I'm just nitpicking. So, this verdict will be a bit different from my other reviews, as I will be giving it two scores. One is a horror game, and another is a game within its own right. As a horror game, I give it a 3 out of 10. While the series started out with the potential of becoming one of the greatest horror franchises of all time, if they had focused on changing the right stuff, lighting, monster designs, etc. But sadly, they took the series in the complete opposite direction, turning it into another action game with a horror aesthetic, and successfully diminished any possible threat by pointing out all of their tricks they planned on using. It doesn't even deserve to be considered an average horror game. There's literally nothing scary about this game. However, as a game within its own right, it gets an 8 out of 10. If I had done a top 5 list for 2013, it would have been number 2. And just because it's so insanely over the top and fun, I definitely had to give it those. 
it had amazing weapon customization. Every weapon packed a punch, and it's just an absolute joy to play. Assuming you can ignore the horrible mistakes they made with the horror parts. If you're just looking for something stupid and fun to play, I highly recommend it. But if you're looking for horror, buy Amnesia or Outlast instead. The only way this game would scare someone is if they're four or something. If you enjoyed this review, like and subscribe. If you have any game recommendations, leave them in the comments. If you're wondering where's my Assassin's Creed 2 review, I set it aside because I'm having a friend of mine do a history series to coincide with each game, and it's taking far longer than I thought it would, much to my dismay. So the review will come when it comes. So the next review will be a surprise, I guess. Have a good night. Did his AI glitch out or something? Because he just keeps jumping back and forth like that. Well, it's certainly entertaining. Oh, piss!